All right, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and especially thank you to my mom, who I found out after my last talk at Pi Ohio. Though she's not a Python engineer, watched all of the, like my entire talk from beginning to end on uh, Django applications. Um, so thank you, mom. I appreciate you watching. Um, this will you, will, you will probably understand less of this one than I did because I understand less of this topic than the Django one. So let's get cracking. Let's have some fun. Um, we are going to build a fake uh, arithmetic logic unit using Python functions. Um, this is the start of a project that I have uh, been undergoing about um, basically starting to understand the basic functions of a computer from the ground up, um, learning how to build a CPU, learning how to build an ALU, um, memory, simulate memory and all that from uh, starting from the most basic computer chips, basic logic gates. Um, so what we're going to do in the course of this talk is, is set up some introductory Python functions uh, that simulate logic gates, basically things that take in ones and zeros and spit out more ones and zeros. And we're going to show how you can do all of this binary arithmetic um, using a very small number of extremely simplistic chips. Um, so I'm excited to share this with you all. This is probably, like I said, the most practically uh, useless talk that you will attend today, but it is easily the conceptually the most fun. Um, so let's get cracking. Um, a little bit about me. Um, my name is, is Joe Mosby. I am a Python engineer at National Journal. We are a political magazine based in Washington, D.C. Um, we are a sister publication to The Atlantic, which uh, also has a branch up here, as does Quartz. Um, so we're all in the same umbrella. Um, I, I got started on this project because I'm a classic computing aficionado. I love collecting old computers, um, old memory, you know, the big cube memories and things like that. I got started on that track. I wanted to know how all of these things worked. Um, and I'm also aspiring to write my own operating system. Um, the, you know, my name being Joe, I, I feel like Joe S is a, neat, is a thing that needs to be introduced to the world. Um, so that's my, that's my end game. That's my end game with all of this. Um, so let's get started by talking about how a CPU actually works. Uh, something that is totally obscured to most of us with Python. We, we know that unless you're really getting into the weeds of, of writing to the core language, to a lot of us, this is something that's totally abstracted away from us. We know the Python language, we know the syntax, but we don't really interact with the functions, with the actual core parts of a CPU much. It's all totally abstracted away from us. Um, and so I wanted to, to do this talk to explain at least one small part of it. But let's talk about the basic, I mean very basic about how a CPU does its business. Um, it has a couple, a couple core parts of how a CPU works. Um, there's a clock that's running through it, and the clock is an electrical pulse. It's just circling through, and electrical, basically an electrical signal that's firing throughout the, throughout the CPU, throughout the motherboard as the computer's running, um, and it's basically going through and, and, and setting all, kicking off all these other instructions. One of those is the program counter. Um, a program counter is literally going through each line of assembly code in a program and saying, okay, this should execute at this time. So you're going, okay, we're going to init 0, 1, 2, and it's like tiny steps of CPU instructions that the program counter is iterating through. When it does that, a CPU cycle uh, is kicked off each time that the clock is running. And it has three parts, um, one of which is cut off. Uh, fetch, decode, and execute are the three parts of a CPU cycle. Fetching is where you are literally going into the program's memory and retrieving the next instruction. You're retrieving the next thing that a CPU is supposed to do. Decoding is where you're sending those signals uh, to, to other parts of the CPU that are actually going to be doing the work. Um, so this is, this is coming in as electrical signals that are, you know, as we know, they're 32-bit they're or 64-bit uh, instructions. The CPU will take those instructions in and decode them to send them throughout the CPU to do the rest of the work, and executing where the work is actually done. Sometimes, uh, not all the time, but sometimes as we're going through an execution cycle, um, the instruction that has to be done is math. Uh, it's, it's basic binary arithmetic. And so when we are doing binary arithmetic, we have the, the ALU. And the ALU is is a very, very simplistic organization at its core. Uh, it, it's doing a lot of complex math, but at the, at the whole, it's taking in two binary numbers, 
and it takes in a few it takes in a few flags there, basically extra flags on a program. The true false, nothing more complex than that, uh, and it's and it's outputting a value. So. The, print, the core principle of an ALU is that we can actually take in two binary numbers. We can take in some flags that are associated with it. And with the right combo of flags, we can compute an entire host of, of arithmetic operations. So you could have, I've got the two flags that you can see there, status and opcode. Uh, a normal ALU is going to have a lot more. But if those flags are set to, say, like 0 and 0, Maybe the combination of zero and zero says, you know what? Depending on whatever, air, like whatever binary numbers come in, we're just going to output zero if they're both set to zero. If the status code is set to one and the opcode is set to zero, we're going to add the two numbers. If they're both set to one, then we're going to do a bitwise and of the two numbers. I mean, you can do all sorts of binary arithmetic operations just by tweaking those flags. Nothing more complex than that. Just imagine that you have these two numbers coming in and this and it's almost like you're opening and closing gates and electricity is just flowing through to say which path you're supposed to go down. Maybe if it's set to a certain gate, you're going to go down this path and you're going to do addition. If it's set to this way, you're going to do subtraction. Um, it's like when you, uh, like if you had a maze that it's actually depending on which doors you open and close, the ball's rolling down a certain path in the, in the, CP, in the ALU. And then you're outputting some sort of status code that could say whether it's a positive or a negative number, whether it's zero, um, whether it's equivalent. Well, my internet just went out. Um, but anyway, if you're taking in uh, two numbers, then you have some sort of sum that's computed. Fix this real quick because y'all are getting cut off graphics and that nobody likes that. Let's see. This is zooming out. Take this and take care of that. Any reason why I might be getting a cut off graphic halfway down, y'all? Any idea? It could be CSS on this monitor. All right. We'll just roll with it and see if I can avoid getting cut off too much. So anyway, we're taking in two binary numbers here, and we've got flags set. We could be we could have those two binary numbers be equal to twenty eight thousand four hundred and five, four thousand five hundred eighty one, and depending on opcodes, we're going to say okay that equals addition, and we're going to float. I don't think see how that CSS is taking out my images, though. Um, maybe it is the Wi-Fi. Let's refresh this. I apologize for this, y'all. There we go. Boom. So I halfway loaded my CSS over the Wi-Fi. So yeah, so we, OK, so we have, um, let's say that our status was set to 1. And the opcode was set to 0101. Maybe that's going to be an arithmetic operation. We're just adding the two numbers um, in this particular ALU. And we're outputting 0 for, for a status that says this is a positive number. I'm just making this up. This is not a, a real ALU. This is more of just saying this is the basic operations of what an ALU does. So we know the ALU is taking in two binary numbers. And based on the status of certain flags, it computes a function. We know that's the basic. We know that's the basic of what happens. From here on out, we're going to get a little weird. Um, I'm going to start building some logic gates. If at any point something is not making sense, then stop me. Um, I don't want it to be because we're going to be doing so many individual components and stacking them on top of each other. If you're stuck on something or something doesn't make sense, just interrupt me in the middle of the talk and let's just make it a little bit more interactive. Because I definitely don't want to get 16 slides down, and we have a, a tiny chip that just didn't make sense at first, and we and we it throws off the entire operation in your brain. So stop me in the middle of the talk if something doesn't make sense. So let's build um, a an ALU. Let's build some basic ALU. I'm not going to get as complex as a 32-bit number or a 64-bit number. We're just going to take a we're going to take two 16-bit binary numbers. We're going to take six control bits. So when I was talking about the flags that turn things on and off, we're going to take six of those. 
and we're going to output one of 18 different functions. And I'm going to show you all at the end how just by tweaking those control bits on and off, you can actually compute each one of these. X plus Y, X minus Y, Y minus X, uh, output a zero, do a bitwise and of X and Y. I'm going to show you all how, to, how setting each of these will, will tweak the AOU slightly and give you the code where you can go back and play with it yourself. So each, we have 18 different functions that can be computed with, depending on how these bits are set, it's going to operate on two 16-bit binary numbers. That's the basics. That's what we're working on. The parts that we're going to build over the course of this talk, we're going to take a single bit OR. And much like the Python OR that we all are very extremely familiar with, um, this one's going to say that if you have two values, could be equal to 0 or 1. If either one of them is equal to 1, then we're going to say that the, that the OR returns a 1. Same thing with NOT and AND, as you would expect. Um, XOR is something that if, you've, if you haven't dealt with much um, you know, if, programming on this level, XOR is basically saying if, if either one of them is going to be, if, if either one of them is, uh, is uh, equal to each other, excuse me, if they're equal to each other, then we're going to say that it's false, otherwise it's going to be a 1. A multiplexer is something that we don't regularly deal with, uh, at least in these terms. But a multiplexer is basically a, an if statement. It says that if the value of a selector is, is 1, then we pick, uh, we pick this number. If it's equal to 0, we pick the other number. It's just choosing between two binary numbers. We're going to do, bit, we need a bitwise not function, which is going to take all of the bits and reverse them. Um, and we need a bitwise and, which is going to compute uh, if, if both things are equal to 1, it will output 1 in that slot in the binary number. Otherwise, it's going to be 0. Again, I'm going to show how, how we're building all these. And then an adder. So if we have uh, two binary numbers, how do we simply sum them together? So that, these are the components. We're going to build a. We're going to show, be able to build all of those functions that I just described: x and y, x plus y, x minus y, just with these parts. And you can. And what we're going to do here is we're going to show these as Python functions. But this is going to be simplistic enough where you can imagine two wires coming in that are actually doing all this work. Two wires that are coming in, and based on the operations of the ch of the chip they went into. Will output some sort. Will output an uh, appropriate value. So you can imagine a. You can imagine on a simplistic level, a chip that takes in two wires, and if either one of them is on, then it's going to it's going to output on. Um, so that's the that's the level that we're trying to think at here. That's the level that the AOU operates on. Um, and and like I said, it's basically like you know this is this is something similar to how an AOU operates. This is not the schematic for an AOU. This is actually a guitar's wah pedal, um, <laughs> but but this is this is the level that we're operating on. We're actually taking in electrical signals. So when I'm showing you ones and zeros, imagine switches being on or off. Imagine like electrical wires being hot or not. Um, so this is. This is what we're dealing with, is this is raw electrical signals. So you can imagine, even though I'm showing you Python functions, you can imagine these being real wires that are turned on and off. So let's start with the first one, uh, which in my opinion is, most, is the most simplistic. Let's say we have an OR chip. Um, an OR chip is going to take in two wires. It's going to take an A wire, B wire. And if either one of them is on, it's going to output on. It's going to output one. Otherwise, it's going to it's going to output zero. It's going to output off. This is simplistic. Like, I mean, this is one of those things where we could honestly probably showcase it in just doing a simple OR. But I want to show like this is a chip that we're going to use. Also, very simplistic. Single like a single bit not. So if 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 the A wire comes in is on, then we're going to output zero. We're going to output off. Otherwise, we're going to output on. We're going to output, we're going to output uh, 1. Same thing with single bit and. If both of them are on, if they're both equal to 1, then we're going to output 1. Otherwise, we are going to return 0. So showcasing these, this is how we're going to use these two. Taking in 1s and zeros. this is how you would use these functions. This is simple stuff. This is kid stuff. You all understand this one. Um, 
but I want to just showcase this is, the, this is the level of simplicity that I want to build off of. So getting a little bit more complex, um, the single bit XOR, which is not something that we deal with as much in Python, um, that you're, you know, it's not, it's, it's a function that's very common at the, at the, at the thing of, of electrical signals moving around, not as much that we're dealing with here, but basically we're saying if A and B are equal, return zero, return off, otherwise return one. Um, so this is, it's something where like and, and or not, these are things that we use regularly, we're talking about Boolean algebra, not this one as much. So then moving, stacking on, adding a little bit more complexity, let's take a 16-bit not. So let's say that we had a binary number coming in as 00010101011, so on and so forth. When we have a 16-bit not, we're doing nothing more complex than flipping the bits of all of those inputs. So this one comes out as 1, this one comes out as 1, this one comes out as 1, 0, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're flipping the bits out of all of those. So you take in that list, you flip the bits, you return, it, you return another 16-bit list that's going to show each of those values. 16-bit and, again, getting a, getting a, again, a little bit more complex. Um, we're taking the, taking in two binary numbers here, formatted as this list, and we're going to say that for each one, we're going to compute the single bit and for, for each of those values. So as we're, as we're looping through the list, we're taking the position and we're computing the, the single bit and of these two. So for here, this one's going to pop out as 0. This one's 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 1. And so on and so forth. So we're doing that for each position and we're turning a binary number that's going to be the binary AND of each of those inputs. Moving on there, the 16-bit multiplexer. Like I said, this is the one that's basically just choosing between two numbers. So we take in these two binary numbers, the ones that are formatted as a list, um, and we've got a, this one here, we're not doing any, any computation on each level. We're basically saying that if a selector bit is equal to zero, then we're going to return the first number. If it's equal to one, we're going to return the second number. And this is, again, where you start to see um, something like, like those opcodes that come, were coming in. The opcodes that we're saying, based on the status of certain flags, um, we're going to output different functions. Um, so you can start to see that, that sort of principle coming in here. Um, as we stack on, the, the multiplexer will be huge in helping us determine which of the functions in the AOU we're going to actually output. So, it, we, it, so as you see this, start to think, okay, the multiplexer is going to be how I choose. So if I know that I need to choose between uh, between outputting this number or that number, the multiplexer is going to be how we're going to do that. Okay, stopping there, stopping on the chips for just now, to talk a little bit about binary addition. If you haven't, or if you haven't done this before, if you've done, uh, if you've done OS programming, then you've probably done this before. I apologize, it's going to bore you for just a second. Um, I'll move on quickly. Um, but binary addition, I want to show a little bit of how it works in case you haven't played with binary numbers before. Because binary numbers, as we do addition, is going to be very similar to how we have uh, how we've been doing these single bit comparisons. Um, so if we are adding these one and one, it's going to be a zero, and we have a carry bit that's coming up over here. So we have to carry like we like when you're doing uh, algebra as a kid, you had to have that carry thing that comes over here. So you have a a one and one is coming up zero, a carry bit's coming here. 1, 0, 1, that's again 0, and the carry bit 1 comes over here. So as we're doing binary algebra, this is, I mean, this is ostensibly all we're doing. If we add two numbers, this is what's happening. It's just this stacked on and on and on and on into perpetuity. But the big thing to notice is that we actually will end up, if, if, we, if we could only handle two bits as outputs. If we say, okay, 0, 1, and 1, 1, if we can only handle two bits as output, we'll scrap that last one. We'll totally, I mean, we'll, we'll throw it out. The operating system won't know what to do with it 
and, and it's going to just throw it out. So when you've run into, when, you, when you've actually wondered, why can I only process numbers at a certain, uh, up to a certain point? If you say, I think it's a JavaScript that actually just gives out if you reach your integer limit. It can only handle integers from, what's the number? Who knows the number offhand about of how many, uh, what's the highest integer range for 32-bit numbers? Does anybody have that one? Yeah, and then and so if you if you have a JavaScript number, which Twitter ran into this problem um, because they were because they were processing their i their tweet IDs as integers, they actually ran into a problem where uh, they hit the limit on how much JavaScript could actually compute because you, they got to the end of the range and you're doing you're doing computation at this level and you just eventually start your numbers start to go off and the clock resets. Um, you lop off that you lop off that most significant bit there. So this is when, if you've wondered why does this happen in an operating system, this is why. Because eventually you can only you only have a certain number of places in your system, and if we only had two places to output a number, you're going to throw out the third one. Um, so I want to I want to bring this one up because this is going to be something that we have to actually take into account as we're dealing with our AOU. There does come a point where we can only have 16, whatever numbers we could max out at, it's 16 bits. So let's do a very, very basic adder, um, where when I showed we had the two numbers and we're going to output a carry bit. Let's say that we've got two single bit numbers. So we've got 1 and 1, or 1 and 0, 0 and 1. Um, we're going to sum those together, and we're going to take whatever was left over. We're going to take what the outside, we're going to take what the carry bit would be. If I flip back, you can see here that this is, I mean, this is an XOR. If these two are equal, this is going to be equal to zero. If these were, if these were both zero, if these were both zero, this is going to be zero. If these are both one, this is going to be zero. But if this was one and zero, it's going to be one. So if these two are equal, we bust out that single bit XOR chip. And you can see that's what I've done here. The sum, what's going to go in the column right under there, is that single bit XOR. And then the carry bit, the extra one, is going to be what happens when you and the two. So I knew that if they were both equal to one, if these two both are equal to one, then I'm going to have a spare carry bit of one that goes up here. And this is how we start to, how we start to build out this function. So my half adder, which is going to simply produce the sum, which is going to go in, in, the, in, the, in the first column there, and then the carry bit, which goes over there, it needs a single bit XOR and a single bit AND between the two numbers. And we're going to return two out. Yes? So, so you're only carrying a number. You're either carrying a 1 or you're carrying a 0, right? Right. So if I had, so I'm still, I am, that's exactly right. Because something, if you can imagine these as two wires that we're running here, something is still going to be wired up to go back over here. If it's a CPU, something is going to be wired up to go over here, even if it's not on. Even if it's not switched on, there is still a connection point here. And it's going to be that carry bit. So there is something going over there. It just might be zero. But it's always going over there. And so that's, again, something to think about as we're thinking of the, using the metaphor of the maze going through. Even if the maze pathway is blocked off, even if it's not on, it's still flowing through. Like, there's still, there's still the possibility of a channel there if you open that gate back up. It's not like it just went away because we didn't carry it. You always have something that's going over. So here we're returning sum and carry. So, okay, that was the... That was the half adder. That's basically saying we're going to output a carry bit, and then we're and then we're losing it. Then, then we're just basically like we're we're sending it over, and we don't know what else is going to happen to it. So let's take a full adder that's going to expect to have a, a possible carry value. So this is going to say it's 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 going to go ahead and plan for when you have those three that possible carry bit there. So here we're doing again the uh, oh I actually copied too many in. Ignore this code. Ignore this part here. Um, 
and, and think of this one right here. This is what happens when you write your chip function, then you just copy your, your code in your HTML. You double up. Um, so the right sum, the one that's going in that farthest right column, is the half adder as we have here. It's, it's reusing that same function. And it's outputting a carry bit. And the, the, sum, of the, carry, the sum of the carry two is going, the sum, excuse me, the sum and the second carry bit is taking in the half adder again. And the next carry bit is going to be doing an or between the two carries. It's going to say if either one of those was present, then we know that something is carrying over into the next one. So again, we're stacking, we're basically just taking in half adders and building more on top of it. And then we're saying, okay, after we've done this arithmetic between the two, did we have any sort of leftover carry bit between the two? If we did, we know that we're going to have to return a, we're going to have to return another carry bit. It's going to be zero and then whatever this was. So this is, the, this again, just taking in just the, the column, it's just expecting that instead of only having two numbers, it's, it's adding the possibility for a third. So ignoring that part there, we're good with this. It's flowing, okay. So now we get to the exciting part. Uh, we get to do this with 16 numbers, with 16 bits. We get to do this operation. I can, this, this was the only GIF when I looked up excited and crazy eyes. This was the best one that I found, uh, which I thought was pretty exciting and definitely needed to use. Um, but yeah, 16-bit adder, it's going to be basically taking this and stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking and stacking more of these adders on top of each other. And when you see the code, you're going to know why I was just this excited to show it to you. Because you get a lot of it. Um, this is more. This is more simple than it looks. I'm I'm initializing here an array that says this is going to be this is going to be placeholders for each of my. This is basically where I'm setting up those connections. No, I'm going to output a 16-bit number. I just don't know what it is yet. So I'm setting up space for all of these things to flow into. And on the first one, I'm saying that my sum and my carry output. It's just going to be doing the half adder. It's just taking in the two. Then I'm moving over to the next round. I'm saying the sum that goes in here and the carry bit that's going over the next round. I'm doing the full adder, where I'm taking in the carry bit from when I, what I did in this slot here. And I'm stacking this on. I'm repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating. And as I'm going through, I am filling out each of these slots. This is not Pythonic. I'm aware that there's easier ways to express this in Pythonic. However, this is how it's, this is, this is the, I want you to be exposed to the guts of how this is actually happening in the CPU. These are wires that are being plugged in. They are flowing back and forth with each other. And you can't just do a for loop there. Because you can't just do a for loop of wires. These are physical things that are connecting the carry bits. They're stitching together. It's weaving it in. So each of these, you're doing each of these operations, and the carry's going to the next line on each one. Then finally, we're going to have an output that says, if you take in these two numbers and you're adding them, then we're returning the sum. You will notice here that my final carry bit, carry 15, is discarded. So if I have two numbers, that were large enough to actually have this carry 15 value be equal to 1, They're, like that last carry bit is discarded. And so if I have two, two numbers that are too big to fit into a 16-bit address space, then my addition is not going to reconcile to decimal. It's not going to reconcile to 28,000 or, or, in this case, 32,768. If it goes over that sum, if it goes to 40,000, then we're out of space. We cannot do that addition operation. This is a limitation of our adder chip. So we can only add numbers up to a certain size, and then we will be off in our computation. How are we feeling? Feeling good? Yeah? Getting no crazy stares yet. Um, I just need to keep talking. OK, so I just want to show how this would work. So the operation that I showed you is this would be, you know, when we see binary numbers, they start over here, right? They start, you know, the least, the, the least significant bit is here, the most significant is here, 
So it's easy for us to read as humans if we start 1, 0, 1, and then this was all zeros over here. But as I'm doing this operation, it's actually the total reverse. Um, so if this is a binary number and I'm showing binary number 1, it would have to be over here. It's not how we normally read them. And so what we have to do to pull this off is just reverse the list. Um, if, you, if you type it out as you would expect it to be formatted, where if this is binary number 36, that's going to be equal to all these zeros, and then 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. This is 36 here. This makes sense to us because it's how we normally see binary numbers. But we have to do the reverse at, you know, to make sure you throw, those, throw that into our function. It is far easier to read this way. We do the same thing here if we have 64, um, which we've got a 1 followed by 6 less significant digits, and then 9 zeros over here. We throw these into our adder. Um, we reverse the list back out. If you printed that out, you're going to get 100. I found out that there's actual HTML entity codes for emojis. Um, I, I, I was like, well, I want to put the 100 emoji in here. How do I do that? There's actually HTML entity codes that you can just drop into HTML. It's, it's fantastic. Um, so yeah, it's a pro tip. You can see that one, obviously, in the HTML after the fact. That might be the best thing you get out of your talk, really, um, is how to put emojis live. And each one, you just Google it. You can see which your emoji in, uh, in the HTML entity code. So let's recap. We have built all of these uh, great chips. We've built an or a single bit or chip that takes in two. We've built in a single bit knot that's taking in one and flipping it. We've built the 16-bit multiplexers, the knot, the and. All of these wonderful chips that I promised you, we've constructed all of them. So you can do each of these functions with, with the chips that you have, but that's obviously not the full thing. I promised you an ar arithmetic logic unit, and I intend to deliver. Um, so let's recap again the functions that we're going to spit out. We're taking in two 16-bit binary numbers. We're going to have these six control bits. We will be able to compute each of these functions based on how we've set the control bits. We're also going to have two outputs, which would be used, which are example things that would be used by your system. If we're going to have an output ZR, which if, we're, if, if the output is totally equal to 0, we're going to set this flag. And if it's negative, we're going to set the output. Uh, if, if the output's uh, less than 0, we're going to set the negative flag. So if we had y minus x and it turned out to be a negative number, we're going to output in g. So let's, let's do this. Um, I am not going to dive too heavily into the computer science about how these things would be individually set. But, we, but let's just say that we have thought through the algebra of how our ALU has to work, the Boolean algebra of how our ALUs has to work. And we're going to say these are instructions that we know we have to compute. We know we have to say that if zx is equal to 1, then we're going to, set, we're going to zero out the x. If nx is equal to 1, we're going to set x equal to negative x. We're going to flip that. If the zy opcode is set, y equals 0, so on and so forth, we get here and we say that if the f flag is set, we're going to add the 2. If the if it's set to 0, we're going to bitwise and the 2. If the NO flag is set, we're going to negate the out. And again, I said that if, those, if the output is 0, we're going to set ZR equal to 1. If the output is less than 0, we're setting NG equal to 1. So this is, this is one of the things where we know that we're going to need these. And this is admittedly something that I'm skipping over because we'd be here for the next eight hours describing enough of Boolean algebra to get to these points. Just trust me on this one. So the, the first parts of our ALU about how we're going to set this up is we have x16 and y16, which are two 16-bit inputs. We have the flags that are coming in, zx, z, uh, zx, zy, and x, ny, f, and no. And we're going to output three values. We're going to say that if it's that it, we have an output, the zr flag, and the ng flag. We are also going to need this constant. Um, so we're going to, we, we've said here that with zx and zy, we, are gonna, uh, we know that we have to zero the x and zero the y if those are set. And so we need something to set them to. And so I've initialized a constant here that's all zeros. It just basically turn everything off. So these, this is what we're going to need. This is what we're going to need to start off with. Moving on, and this is by far not the end of the function. 
um, but the, the first part of this function is we've got to determine which x value we have to use. So with these two values here, we're actually going to change the value. Like, we know that we have, might have to zero the x. We know that we might have to negate the x. So we actually need to set, we actually need to read those flags in and set which one we're actually going to use. So if zx is set, we've got a 16-bit multiplexer that we're going to throw, out, throw this out at. We're going to take in, in our multiplexer, the x value. We're going to take in on the other part the all zeros flag, or the, excuse me, the all zeros constant. And based on what that, based on what zx is set to, we're going to output it, whether it's supposed to be zeroed or not. We're going to do the same thing here with negating the x by throwing it into a not a 16-bit not value. And then once we've done all of that, we're going to say um, you should use the 16, you should use the zero or the not x if, you should, excuse me, you should use the output of this here or negated x if the negated x selector is set. Yeah? Okay, we're feeling okay about that. We know this is basically just getting us to a point that says when we throw everything into the final function, we're going to use whatever this is set to, is use x. Same thing with y. This is exact, the exact same structure of code. Based on what zy and ny are set to, we're going to return either a zero y or the, excuse me, the, the y that came in, the zero y or the negated y based on those selector values. So now we've, got, we've computed the x we're going to use. We've got the y we're going to use. We've done this basically by, by setting a group of switches and, using our, and let our multiplexer chip decide which one it's going to. So now we need to compute those two functions that we said. We said that if f was equal to 1, we were going to add the two numbers. And if f, if f was equal to 0, we were going to do a bitwise and. And you can see that I'm doing these here. If add xy is, is if add, we're going to compute these, use a 16-bit adder to add the two numbers, we're going to use the 16-bit and to do a bitwise and of the two numbers. And then we're going to say that, the, that, that this would be the positive out there. So we note there's our selector bit coming in. And we're going to say that, that basically take in these two, and based on our, excuse me, this is and right here, add and and. And we're going to say that based on what the selector f was set to, we're going to output pause out. We have this no flag here that could cause us to negate that output, so we're going to take that in. And then we're going to say, all right, our 16-bit multiplexer, based on the value of whether we have this no flag set or not, is going to say if we should use the positive output or the negative output. And then the negative value is set to the last, di the last digit of our binary number because that's going to be the flag that says whether it's a negative number or not. We, we have this concept of signed and unsigned numbers. And we're assuming that we have, we're assuming because this is here, that we have this ability to return a negative number. If you go, if you go to the point where this is equal to, where the last, di the last bit, the 16th bit is equal to 1, we're saying this means you have a negative number. So that's going to say that if this one is set, we're wiring that up to the ng output, the negative output. Yeah? Good? All right. And so now we have to do the last little bit, which is compute if any of these are equal to 0. And we do this by saying, OK, if any single one of these input, if any, any single one of these output bits is equal to zero, or is equal to one, excuse me, then we know it's not zero. They would have to all be equal to zero. And so we're going to say that with each one of these, we're going to basically stack up these single bit ors and compare the two. And keep, and basically like a little tree, we're going to keep adding them up. And if the final thing, if the final value that we get to is equal to zero, then we know that we know that we're going to, we have a totally zero number. Not a single one of those was ever equal to one, because if any point in this, if any point in the tree had been equal to one, it would have made it one all the way up. So we're going to say if if these are equal to zero after all these computations are done, 
we know we have a zero number, but we said that we have to set the zero flag equal to one if it's zero, and so we're just negating that. We're just going to flip it over. Yeah? Okay. I'm getting some, I'm getting nods. I'm getting a, a one or two confused stares. I'm not going to call you out. Um, but like this, but this is basically what we're, what we're doing to compute if we have a zero output. So we've got our output, we've got our zero flag, we've got our, our negation, and we're going to say, okay, fine, we're done. We have built an ALU using only the chips that we've built out here. You, you've seen how all they're used. We have built us an ALU. But obviously, we've got to show it in practice. So let's say that, 36, that we had 36 and 64 coming in again. I'm going to reverse them like you saw before. And if I was just going to add them, if I, didn't, if I just wanted to add the two numbers, then I know this F flag, the F position right here, if that's equal to 1, I'm going to add them. And so everything else is set to 0, except for the F flag to say, OK, we're going we're to add these two numbers. You can throw them into that function. And I'm going to get these outputs. They're going to say, OK, we know it's not 0, and we know it's not negative. The output is still equal to 100. We've, we've, we've computed a, a simple addition operation using our ALU. Like I said, you can try this out at home. The codes will be there. I'll show you. I'll put it on the slides at the end. You can, you can test me out. So the truth table for how this ALU is going to work, and this is, this is all of the flags and how you're going to tweak them on and off. Remember, like I said, this, this is unfortunately Boolean algebra where we take eight hours to get through all of these. But this is the truth table of how you have to set each of these values for our sample ALU to compute all of our functions. If we say the simple version, if we 0x and 0y, those two flags are set, and we add them together, we're going to get 0. If I zero these out, if I zero these out to where I've got, I basically set them both equal to 0, and then negate them, then add them, and then negate the output, I get 1. It's one of those brain benders a little bit, but that's how this is going to flow. Same thing where if I have, if I 0 the x, negate the x, 0 the y, but don't negate it, and then add the two numbers together, I get negative 1. So same with if I'm going to, if I'm going to, if I just wanted to output x, and this is how I would, uh, this is how I get it. If I'm going to output y, the flags I set, and so on, and so forth. All 18 functions, based on how you set those flags. And again, I invite you to try this out at home. So thank you all. We've built an ALU. Um, it's one of those where I, I, I'm inviting you to try it out. I want you to go back home. I want you to check it out yourself. Um, we've modeled it out, um, but it is something where I hope this invites you to, to check this out and play around with it a little bit more. The link to the presentation is here. Um, the code that I have used is on the link immediately under it, where you can actually see each of those codes, each of those functions that I put underneath it. Um, and if, you're, if this is a topic that interests you more, then I invite you to check out NAND to Tetris, which is a fantastic course. It's something I've been going through. It takes the same approach. It's actually saying, OK, let's take a small number of chips, and let's build out these individual components of a computer. Let's build out a CPU. Let's build out how memory works at a basic level. And then finally, we get Tetris. Like That's literally what you're adding up to, is you're going to build a Tetris game that you can play using your keyboard using only the simple little logic gates that you built out. It's a wonderful, it's a wonderful course in how CPUs are built. Um, it's a wonderful course in, in showing basic assembly and, and, and doing this all with 16-bit numbers. So this is a topic that interests you more. I invite you to check it out. Um, I am all done. I am happy to take questions. Yes. As far as as far as doing sixteen bit versus thirty two or eight or something like that.
Um, if we just did, if we did 64, first, you're right, it definitely wouldn't fit on a slide. Um, but second, you're getting into a level of complexity where for this talk format, it's not necessarily going to, uh, it's not, it's not going to be useful to do that much. And it's also, once you've sort of seen 16-bit, you can extrapolate 32 and you can extrapolate 64 because because like I showed with the 16-bit uh, addition chip, it's basically just doing more, doing more of the same thing. So once you get to 16-bit, you're getting a reasonable degree of complexity that you can see the flow, but without just trying to process 64 numbers on the screen at the same time. Yes, thank you. Yes. I, I, as far... So the NAND to te so if you just want to do like a very basic emulator, the NAND to Tetris um, course that I referenced referenced here actually comes with an emulator that does exactly that. It's Java based, um, and it basically takes in the the basic functions and constructs those off of that. Um, I have also tried to take basic assembly and build my own operating system in a virtual machine. That is wickedly difficult. I mean, just to like say I'm going to I'm going to log in and just like print hello world in pure assembly is uh, is extremely difficult. It's not even like understanding assembly code. It's just like finding the emulator that works on your particular machine and can handle the assembly code you're throwing at it. Uh, but it's definitely a goal to to get to that level. Any other questions? Yeah. Mostly a tribute to myself, which is the name. Um, I wanted to run on all of my computers and preferably most of the world. Um, <laughs> but no, as far as specific operating system goals, I do not have any laid out just yet. Yeah, I could do I could do that, but that wouldn't be nearly as much fun. It's one of those like, is it is it useful? No. Will I enjoy doing it? Absolutely. All right. Thank you all for coming out. I'm happy to stick around for a few more questions after.